All right, you primitive screwheads, listen up. What an excellent day for an exorcism. Horror. There is no shortage of monsters to haunt our dreams. Horror. You got red on you. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Horror. Alive. <laughs> it's alive. Truly. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Oh the Horror. I'm Rob Holmes, and today I am joined by my buddy Mike Haston. Hey Mike, how you doing? Hey dude, uh, doing all right. You know, uh, just uh, living the dream, as they say. Yeah, uh, doing uh, Christmas pandemic style, I guess. Thank you for having me on to uh, to discuss some of these. I mean, some of my favorite horror movies are the old ones. Yeah. Uh, growing up, and then you go back as an adult, and you're like, how how was this PG? <laughs> so yeah, I guess the topic for today uh, that we're talking about is we are talking about PG horror and how PG horror used to actually mean something, and it was actually intense. So the ratings didn't really matter as much back in the day, up until 1984. When PG-13 was, you know, first brought uh, into the mainstream in the United States. And what was the uh, the first horror movie, I guess, that got a PG-13 or, or the first movie in general, I guess? It was Red Dawn. Okay. Yeah. I remembered it was something I'd seen, but, uh, <laughs> but couldn't remember exactly what. And it's solely because of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Oh, okay, yeah. With all the heart ripping and everything. Yeah, now apparently like the Flamingo Kid was the first to actually get the rating of PG-13, but the first to actually be released uh, was Red Dawn on that. But yeah, basically what happened is Temple of Doom came out. You know, Gremlins had come out and that had already been pushing some stuff, but then Temple of Doom with the heart ripping scene comes out and parents are up in arms. And Spielberg had mentioned, you know, there should be something between PG and R. And PG-13 was born. And that's where things have started to get strange over the years. Like, through the 80s, PG-13 was rare. But it would happen. Um, and some of those movies are pretty solid, where you're like, oh, PG-13, you think, like, mid-90s. You think, oh, they can't get away with much. Have you seen The Bride? Oh, yeah. 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 That, uh, that really... Pretty much got away with everything they possibly could under that rating. Yeah. Um, it's it's and of Jennifer course a, Beals a lot of full the, frontal nudity, yeah. Right, yeah. So, but uh, but 13-year-olds like nudity, you know? So I see they, they threw everyone a bone, no pun intended, by saying we're not going to make this R-rated. Your parents are going to think it's fine to go to the theater. Yo, yeah. what's up? So... Well, if you look at some of the stuff from the PG uh, era, even going back to Hammer films and, and some of those other ones, some of the Italian giallos that were technically PG had insane amounts of nudity and very intense violence. Like, mm -hmm. you're watching this, you know, uh, PG giallo, like the bird with the crystal plumage is rated PG. Oh, gosh, I didn't know that. Wow. And it is, it's one of... I, I would say it's, you know, one of uh, Argento's tamer films, but it's still a very viscerally violent uh, Hitchcockian thriller. Right. Even tame Argento is is uh, pretty hardcore. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so fascinating to see now when someone says PG horror or PG-13 horror even, and we talk about the modern day, um... I guess it's starting to get a little bit of a comeback, but I remember between the 90s and, like, the early 2000s, PG-13 was, like, the death knell of horror. Yep. I was going to say the kiss of death. Absolutely. Because, yeah. yeah, you'd be watching a trailer and you're like, ooh, this looks cool. And then it'd say PG-13 at the end and you'd immediately write it off because it was so sanitized. Yep. You know what I mean? It's not like the, the older ones you were talking about. And, you know, when you first said... Uh, we were going to be talking about PG horror movies for me anyway. Uh, PG stands for poltergeist. I know that's one word, but that, uh, you know, I was, I was thinking about that last night. Like the, the mirror scene where the guy peels his face off, Oh my gosh. that was terrifying. And then, you know, when you talk to people who grew up and, and saw poltergeist, you know, when they were younger, um, a lot of them, nine out of 10, even the thing that scared them the most, that stuck with them the most is not the skeletons coming up out of the pool, which were real skeletons. 
skeletons because mm-hmm. that movie was insane. Um, but it's like the tree tapping on the kid's window and stuff and the clown in the corner of his room. Yeah. And they they it's almost like they had to be better at at making the movie they wanted to, at telling the story they wanted to, because, yeah, there wasn't a PG-13 or whatever, but they knew if they pushed too hard, then they were going to wind up in R-rated territory. And they they really pushed right to the edge of the envelope there um, as far as what you could do. And I think you told me at one point, Toby Hooper, of course, who did Poltergeist, uh, was trying to make uh, a PG horror movie when he did... Texas Chainsaw, right? Yeah. And it was just so disturbing that the ratings board gave it an X rating and then they had to pare it down to an R or whatever. But if you, I mean, you remember how creepy and crazy and wild it is, mm-hmm. but there's honestly not too much gore, barring no. the guy running around with dried corpse faces on himself. Um, yeah, I think, I think like putting someone up on the meat hook is one of the most visceral things, the sledge to the head, but there's no visible gore from that. Right. And even even the chainsaw scene um, where the annoying brother gets uh, hit with the chainsaw, there's no gore to that. There, you know, he, right. he gets hit with this thing and, and you just you hear it and it just sounds awful and very visceral. And it's really it comes down to like people's imaginations running so wild that it was just so disturbing and just so off kilter that it's not for a general audience or or even a parental guidance suggested there's something more to it you know right like you said it makes you feel something i've always uh considered that scene almost like going to the dentist really (laughs) like uh like um you know you can't see inside your mouth what the dentist is doing whether they're drilling whether they're you know whatever they're doing but you that's why so many people are afraid of the dentist is because of that dread mm-hmm. that that you your imagination is running wild like oh my god i'm sure this is what's happening right. you know what i mean and um they they really did a great job working with that um and and presenting a a crazy scenario but not showing it to you letting your brain do the work and fill in the the blanks or the chunks as it were um yeah and uh and of course, you know, then the next couple Texas Chainsaws just went wildly off the rails and over the top. But, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, what the the gate was PG, right? Like with Stephen Dorff and stuff. Uh, the gate is actually, I think, the gate's PG thirteen, and that that took advantage of the of the PG thirteen nineteen eight because it was eighty seven, I think, and it took advantage of what they could do with PG thirteen because even some of the stuff in there with your it touches on Lovecraftian horror. It it has this body horror element to it that's a little too... Whew. But one that's PG that surprised me is Beetlejuice. Oh, yeah, yeah. I always forget about that. Because, of course, they curse in it. Yeah. There's a... Uh, there's a I don't know if they ever say exactly how old Beetlejuice is, uh, but he's, of course, trying to marry a teenage girl. You yeah. know, he's definitely above the age where you can do that. Well, I mean, um, it's not it's not a PG film when you look at it. And there's a moment there's so much sexual innuendo. He even says nice fucking model when he grabs his crotch and you hear the honk honk when the part of the model falls over uh, for the miniatures. And it's like, wait, this is PG. We're dealing with these strange. Car- it's very cartoonish and strange. But like. So many adult themes, so mm, much it's full going of suicides and yeah. all sorts of yeah, and it's and it's PG, so that shows you like what are these what do these ratings even mean, especially back then? I mean, the Goonies is PG, and they say you know I mean they say shit or whatever. They don't say a ton of stuff in there, but you know you're putting people in peril and dread, this that and the other, and that's PG. And that's 1985, so it's like they still didn't even know what they were doing with this PG-13 rating as, as an intermediary between PG and R. But hell, good. I'm sure Spielberg, being a producer on it, could, <laughs> you know, yeah. since he had kind of suggested the whole PG-13 rating and everything, I'm sure he could uh, kind of skirt, you know, the issues there. Well, but yeah, yeah, you look at it and there's there's mobsters trying to kill kids, the... Ma Fratelli threatens to cut Corey Feldman's tongue off and throw it in a blender. Yeah. You know, um, uh, there's, of course, all the skeletons they find on their way 
throughout the the bone organ that's entirely made of dead bodies. Um, I mean, there's literally kids are a step away from death at every point Dude, of the movie. Data once with they the pictures go of that power, grave. man. Like literally, if those things didn't sum with one of his devices. It magically worked. Nothing works. And then that one magically ends up hooking him up there, gets him to about the punji sticks. And then what's crazy is that he's hanging there and I'm waiting for the thing to let go because I'm like, none of his shit works. But it worked. Right. I know. And that one is the one you, you would have the least faith in. Those little chattering teeth are going to hold a whole kid up, you know, midair and save mm-hmm. him. for. But hey, cool. I'm glad it worked. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the octopus was very scary. It was so scary they removed it. And, <laughs> but if you've, if you've the seen films. the TV version, uh, then you've seen it. Or if you've seen mm-hmm. the deleted scenes, you've seen the octopus scene where they just shove the Walkman in its mouth and in its it, beak, yeah, yeah, and its little beak thing, yeah, and it just goes. And then off. it like rocks out while it's going away. It's like, oh yes. And I guess it Death showed Leopard. that Sony made a waterproof Walkman. That's uh, that's quality, right? They, uh, they, of course, a lot of those older movies had glorified commercials for things. I mean, yeah. Home Alone probably sold so many talk boys, you know. Oh my and, gosh, yeah. It's like if they had a, if they had a little thing in there that was like a novelty device. Yeah, it went, it went crazy. Now, there's some there's some movies that people don't realize. Like, let's see, I think it was 1972. The original Tales from the Crypt movie came out, and that's a, that's a very violent film for you know a british film that came out in in the early 70s um and still rated pg Mm -hmm. and of course though they were based on the old ec comics and stuff uh you know tales from the crypt tales from the vault uh uh, i forgot the witches one something of secrets the tomb of secrets or something yeah um, it's the vault of horror tales from the crypt and uh oh wow that's the a re- house of. They also had the House of Mystery and the House of Secrets. But yeah. The one with the witch, I cannot remember the name of, and I had so many of the reprints of those growing up, and not only were the stories creepy, like the art was oh. really unnerving. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't the level of. I've gone to the bookstore in third grade and I bought um, scary stories. Oh my God, what is this picture? But it was close. Yeah. And um and yeah, for them to have made a movie based off that, I mean, of course it was going to be disturbing as hell. I think uh, people back then were probably surprised that it was PG and not R, um, you know, given the source material and what was in it. Well, and then, you know, it, it seemed that um, PG almost became because, you know, in the 80s, films kind of cross genre. There was a lot of cross genre stuff going on more so than in any other decade, because it seemed like audiences turned away from cross genre stuff in the early to late 2000s. Like people just thought it was a weird thing and didn't make sense. Um, But like Return to Oz took The Wizard of Oz and threw a horror spin on it. And it's PG. Oh, yeah, that one was weird. Yeah, but it creeps people out. But it's one of those where it's. It's creepy enough even for an adult audience, but not something that's going to mess them up forever. But it's definitely creepy enough for a kid's audience that can handle that. You know, like if they're into that without being too saccharine. Mm-hmm. Um, the Burbs does kind of the same thing. That's PG. And it's <laughs> I dealing love with. But we're also dealing with Joe Dante. Joe Dante is a master at PG family horror. Right. Like Gremlins, course, Gremlins, yeah. like you said, yeah. Mm-hmm. And of course, there was such a tonal shift between Gremlins one and two. Like, oh, Gremlins yeah. one has a, a like the science teacher or whatever gets his heart eaten. You know what I mean? And then Gremlins two is is almost a, a comedy. You know, um, but yeah. uh, but both classics in their own right. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of older movies kind of switch genres in between with great success. Alien, and then uh, you know, Alien was basically. Uh, a Hitchcocky and Agatha Christie esque horror in space, you know, um, playing on the themes of isolation and everything. And then Aliens, which is also awesome, but yeah. doesn't even feel like the same movie because uh, it's like a straight up James Cameron action fest, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, and but I mean, then we're dealing with we're dealing with heavy R territory on both of those. Oh yeah. But it's nice to see them, you know, taking that type of stuff where it's like. People still consider Alien and Alien straight-up horror when they are very much science fiction films. Right. 
which is also cool because we we do hit a lot of I do like that cross genre stuff and I think I think people are accepting of it more but I remember there being a time where filmmakers or, or studios were just like yeah, this doesn't make sense we're not going to put this type of movie out or they didn't know how to promote it properly mm-hmm. um, now other PG stuff like The Dark Crystal you know we got that we've got Teen Wolf was PG uh, but you're hitting like a comedy a, more of a comedy territory dude if we want to get on one that's messed up and they just remade it recently and did not do a good job on it in my opinion is 1990s The Witches oh yes dude. yeah that was that that one was one that stuck with you as a kid that dude that gave me hell. I got nightmares off that stuff just the, it's the transformation scenes the way the smoke comes out of them is they're when you know when the there's like the shrinking to mice and stuff yeah. shrinking into mice and watching like how they the animatronics they used in that and like the way that they did the stuff because it's before they're using cg you know like they're actually using puppetry and and henson like uh muppet type stuff and and actually it was done by jim henson company because i was they gonna did, say i thought it was yeah because yeah. they did the witches they actually did the reveal for the witches and showed all of that i mean it's really well done and it, but the thing is why it's so disturbing is that it's practical effects. Right. And it sticks with you. Now, this new one is just a it's a it's a mess. You know, it's a CG mess where you're not really making them witches. You're just saying, check it out. They only have two fingers. And then at the same time, you're like, I saw that there's huge backlash by people with disabilities and stuff or. Um, yeah, saying like you're treating like the dactyly and stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. and they're like you're treating people like they're monsters, but they're they're not. They're just people. They're normal people. So why are you making it that this is how witches are? And it's like, well, that's that's dumb. Why didn't you go off the? Why, why remake it? I liked the one from 1990. I thought it was perfect. Yeah, you didn't need to touch that one at all. And it's all isn't it all based on like a rolled doll book? Yes, like, yes. I think he did it. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, it was just like. You know, I was thinking um, last night, I was thinking about Poltergeist and how the tree was the scariest part for a lot of people and the clown for others and and so on and so forth. And thinking about, uh, is it Terrifier with Art the Clown and stuff? Okay, Um, because that was super popular for a while. And the thing that everybody wouldn't shut up about there was was when he's got the girl hung upside down, you know, and he cuts her in half, like, you know, through genitals to head, basically. Yeah, the the hacksaw, yeah. And that's still like it's gross and it's gory yeah. and it's memorable, but I still don't think that's as scary as like the tree tapping on the window and stuff. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying about like they, they had to have more of a, a vision for what they were doing. And yeah. again, uh, like that was practical. Yes, but it wasn't as close up as practical effects in like the thing or American werewolf in London and things like that. Like those practical effects blew everything out of the water. Well, this is also playing it for comedy. It's in the same way when I look at like, I I think that, you know, sleep away camp Two. There's moments where I'm like, are you kidding me? Cause it just catches (laughs) you off guard the first time you see it. Cause you're not expecting it to go as far as it does sometimes. And absolutely. And when it does, you're like, Okay, but there's never a moment where I'm like scared by it. It's not meant to. And it's the same way where in Terrifier, I think the visceralness of the brutality of that kill is like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. But you're also talking about something that's meant to be comical because it's so over the top. When we are dealing with some of this PG horror that is meant to be taken oh so seriously... Poltergeist takes it on a whole nother level between the tree, between the closet looking like part of organs of of some larger creature that you would be sucked into because you're seeing tendrils of this stuff coming out. Like, there's so much that they don't fully show or they tease or when you see that um, creature blocking uh, Jo Beth Williams from getting up to the upstairs to the door and she falls backwards and it's just like almost like a dog-like monster creature thing that's there. It's this skeletal beast and then it's gone. You see it once. 
And then right. you see another giant head that tries to, you know, come out of the door later on in the film. It's these small things that you never fully see. We don't fully get enough time to, like, linger on them to to have them wear out their welcome or to see the seams or to see the issues. And that's what makes Poltergeist so genuinely great. And I think people have a tough time believing that Toby Hooper directed it because it, it, it just has this... It has this Spielbergian touch to it. And it's like, yes, that's what producers do. Producers who are hands-on give a feel to a movie. The director is helping to shape that vision. And you can yeah. see, I can see so much Toby Hooper in that film. Oh, yeah. Yeah, once you know it is. I mean, when I, because watching it as a kid, I didn't care who directed it or, you know, what happened. Yeah. And it wasn't like a, Spiel, a Spielberg movie where it's that's part of almost the title. It's like Steven Spielberg's Jaws. Steven Spielberg, you know what I mean? Going back and finding out, oh, this was the guy that did Texas Chainsaw and stuff? Like, that was shocking. And then, of course, he did stuff. Uh, what's the one with the naked space vampires? That one was cool. Life, Life Force. Force. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I mean, you know, he, he was all over the place. But he definitely did his best work either when he was totally left to his own devices, mm -hmm. like Texas Chainsaw, or where he had, as you said, a hands-on producer, like a guiding hand, like Spielberg, who could kind of help shape his vision. Because his vision was neat enough in the first place. You know what I mean? And yeah. he was he was always really good, uh, like you were saying earlier about Texas Chainsaw, about letting your mind fill in the blanks. You know, Um yeah, you see that giant head when they get Carol Ann out of the portal coming after her. Like, you know, they don't want to let her go from the other side and everything. But what's almost scarier is what your brain draws as that thing's body. And, oh, my God, how, what's the rest of this look like? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and yeah, that's it's kind of a lost art um, nowadays, you know, um, because as you were saying earlier, you know, for a long time, if it was a horror movie and you're, you see PG or PG 13, you're like, okay. Cause a lot of the people making these nowadays don't know how to, they don't give you enough to let your brain do the heavy lifting. They just cut away mm -hmm. or imply what yeah. has happened. And you're like, okay, you know, blood splatter or what have oh, you. Oh dude, they always, it's and, such a stylistic approach that is like, and, and not a good one. You know, it's the, Let's pan away and splatter blood. Let's just cut away. We'll find the body later, devoid of any blood to make sure, whatever. And it's, there's a lack of creativity, but it's so formulaic and, and done to death. But then you look at one thing that, that kind of blows my mind, and I was going to bring up Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters 2, because you, you have two PG films that then get a reboot slash remake that is PG-13. Mm -hmm. Yet if you look at which ha which one is more intense overall, like the original is super intense. Right, absolutely the, the first one, yeah. Ghostbusters 2 is very heavy in sexual themes. There's a lot of mature sexual themes in that. There's a lot of just creepy, gooey grossness. Yet both of them are PG. Yet this, this juvenile one from 2016 which was very just cg laden comical you know mm -hmm. it wasn't meant to be taken seriously at all is pg-13 so it's just it's strange to just see how people think that when they are making something a new version of it they need to make it more intense like invasion of the body snatchers um let's say the one from 78 right so i think it's 78 and that's With pg sutherland yeah yeah, and then you're looking at the one from, like, 1990 or the early 90s, and that's R. Mm-hmm. And it's like... And it wasn't nearly as scary as the old one, yeah. No, not even close, because they want to show they want to show a little more gore here, or this or that, but they then get censored by the MPAA that wants to pull back. They'll say, oh, we'll give you an NC-17 or an X if you go too far. So then all of a sudden these kills that are supposed to make this film that much more intense or visceral end up getting neutered back down, and you end up with a movie that is less effective because it was relying on those instead of actual tension. Right, exactly. They're just using set pieces and gore and everything and not relying on 
on emotion and building sense of dread or, or you know, apprehension. or f- They're horror movies without a sense of fear. They're yeah. horror movies that just go, they, they fill in the blanks until uh, just between gore, gore, reveal, gore, you know, and um, it just, it does not work nearly as well. That's well, not to say there's no good ones. But it's just yeah. it's it's it takes a deft hand and a skilled filmmaker and and crew to to tell a, a scary story where the audience is not not necessarily feeling like they're in the movie, but they feel like they're experiencing the same things that the people in the movie are experiencing, and that's what makes it scary you know what i mean um Mm. in those older ones like you're scared when uh, you know again like the poltergeist when the skeletons are popping out of the the pool because you're feeling just as terrified and whoa what the hell is happening as as the mom in the movie is you know what i mean you're on this roller coaster with them and Mm. a lot of these newer movies even if they're good and stuff like if you jump at a at a, a gory part or whatever it's not because of the emotion. It's not because of the attachment to the characters. It's because of the gore itself. Yeah. And and a lot of times, like you were saying, with with non practical effects and everything, it it takes you even further out of it because it's so obvious that you're like, oh come on, you know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. you're trying to to feel what these people are feeling and go through what they're going through, but you shouldn't have to try. You know what I mean? Like it should. That's th- th- those older movies that really worked well with the PG rating and and so on. They took your hand at the beginning of the movie and led you through this these stories and um, and you were with them every step of the way. And that was another, you know, to use the take you by the hand analogy. They creeped you out so much that that you might not want to follow, but they would drag you by the arm through it. And that's what made them so effective and resonant and and classic, really. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, and if we want to even get into effective PG-13 horror, there's one that no one ever talks about. I mean, no one talks about this film, yet they should. And I think the reason is, is because it's just very creepy. Arachnophobia. Mm Mm-hmm. I never really hear that brought up in conversation when it comes down to, like, movies that that are just uncomfortable. Like, because it is, you know, it's a comedy horror, but because it's these spiders, and it's just such common situations that you see them in, you know? It's like a weird killer version of a spider. It's not going the eight-legged freaks route, which is fun, Eight Legged Freaks was stupid fun because it's it's just campy PG thirteen harkening back to the nineteen fifties movies, but basically embracing crappy CG. Basically, Eight Legged Freaks is like is Birdemic. Uh, oh God, yeah. But but done with a budget. Yeah, I was gonna say a bigger budget. It's like the original Only Sharknado. Slightly. It's the original yeah. Sharknado. Because it's giant spiders, just in it, it's so absurd. I was like, this can't be a real movie when I first saw the poster in the trailer. I was like, this has to be a joke. And I'm like, oh, it's a real movie. And then I saw it and I was like, all right, this is awful CG, but just like the movie Evolution, I was still entertained. Right. Um, But then, if we want to go off of like movies that just creep me out that I don't watch very often because spiders are a little, I'm, I'm, I'm a little iffy with. Arachnophobia is that type of movie that is just, yeah, if you really want to mess with someone, get them to watch that. And it was also really unsettling uh, because it, there was so much comedy in it. Like, I remember the scene where I think it was Julian Sands from Warlock that was yep. like the, the uh, you know, spider expert or whatever. When they find him, like, webbed up against the wall in the barn or whatever, like, there's nothing super gory about it, but that was creepy as hell. And I just remember there being moments of, like, people eating popcorn or eating normal things, and then all of a sudden... There's a spider in the bowl, yeah. Well, you see the spider there, and then it cuts away, and you're like, no, 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 they were about to grab it, oh my gosh, what's happening? And then it cuts back, and you see someone enter the house, and you see that person sitting there, like, where they're watching TV, eating, 
and like I think a spider or something crawls out of their nose or out of their mouth and they're dead. Yeah. And I'm like, <gasps> that that's one of those moments where that's effective. It didn't need to be gory. It didn't need to be super gross. But like you've built tension and you've built fear. It was directed by Frank Marshall. So like, you know, I expect there to be at least not all of his films, obviously, but there to be some level of quality, at least back in 1990. Right. Um, and I think that's, you know, it, it shows that it doesn't have to be R necessarily. I always, I, man, dude, I talk shit about PG-13 horror so much, but usually the stuff I'm talking, I talk shit about is, is the stuff that was like remakes of Prom Night. You know, or basically uh-huh. the, the PG-13 remake syndrome, which also happened. It was either PG films that got remade as R and they went too far with the gore or or not even enough with the gore because they ended up getting censored and they just didn't have good tension and good like scares or the opposite of like, here's an R rated movie and now we're doing a PG-13 remake and it's it's going to be filled with like CG blech. Yeah. And like what well, Black Christmas, the original was R, right? And uh, yeah. and then that that newest one was God, so sanitized and weird, and had nothing to do with anything, you know? Um, yeah, I, I think it's. I would say it's Black Christmas in title only, and that's it. it it's its own story. I'm not going to get into my feelings right, on that the, film at all, but right. you know, um, I will get into my. Well, I didn't like the re- the original remake of Black Christmas, but. That was because they kept trying to make it even more violent and up the gore and do all this other stuff to it and make it crazier. And I'm like, you realize the original, even though it's R, the reason it is so scary is because it's like it's what you're not seeing. It's about not knowing who Billy is, you know? Yeah. And you and never see the killer, do you? Or you see you see his it. eye, man. You see his right. eye, and that is like in this terrifying moment through the crack in the door. And I think that that's where that's where horror used to lie a lot of the time um, back in the 70s. If you look at a lot of horror, what the, what it was rated, most of it was like PG. You know, you had your R stuff, obviously, but there was a lot of PG stuff where I'm like, this, this should not be PG. <laughs> right. Yeah, there was a ton of those. I mean, what Jaws was PG, right? Jaws is totally PG. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for the most part, it's pretty sanitary or, you know, not gory. But I mean, the dead body on the beach in the beginning is pretty messed up. Quint sliding into the shark, you know, as he eats the boat. Dude, the Um, kid, the kid, like, you know, the kid on the raft. Yeah, that right there is. is But you don't you don't see him get eaten, right? You just see the bloody raft torn to shreds. You see it come up around him and stuff. And then like you see the bloody mom screaming and everything. for him. Yeah, it's so. But that that's what I'm talking about. I think in in with Gremlins, Gremlins has some really messed up moments for a PG film. You know, it gets pretty violent with these creatures straight up killing a few people and and trying to kill more, you know? And yeah, as we said, Poltergeist, Twilight Zone the movie is PG. Right, Twilight, and that's pretty crazy. And that led to actual, like three actual deaths in real life. I was going to say life. that the most horrific thing there was on the set, yeah. Yeah, Vic Morrow and two of the uh, child extras, right, got decapitated yeah. by the helicopter. Yeah, yeah. It just, uh, I guess, one of the fireworks or pyro stuff went off um, and hit the helicopter, or and it came down, and he tried to shield them, but the ro- or the rudder came off and decapitated two or Morrow and one of the kids, and the hel- rest of the helicopter crushed the other kid. So, oh, gosh. I mean. It's, it's absolutely awful. And then even when you're watching the film, there's moments in the movie that are just super intense. Like, it is not a PG movie. It, it has intense moments and just straight up imagery, like pulling the rabbit, the creepy demon rabbit out of the hat, you know, that animated like thing from hell. And, you know, the the thing on the plane, which has been the parody. goblin on the wing yeah, the thing. Goblin, yeah. the, well, technically, it's a gremlin because they always talk I was, about I thought it was. But I, uh, yeah, I, I they didn't talk know, about my well, brain was just like, we're talking about gremlins. Well, that was the, yeah. the, the old thing was gremlins. Uh, you know, they mess the with cartoons. your machinery and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Because, of course, in the first Gremlins movie, that's what Mr. What Futterman is always saying. That's, he blames, yep. blames every every breakdown of his equipment and machinery. He's, oh, it's the Gremlins. Yeah. And then it turns out that there are Gremlins. But, yeah, it was, I mean, that was, uh, you know, kind of a folklore thing that that Gremlins would be around to, to mess with your, your stuff and screw it up. 
Um, and then it just went farther because I guess, you know, they treated the human body like a machine and messed that up too. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's interesting because even movies like, dude, The Devil's Reign with William Shatner is PG. I don't think I've seen that one. Ernest Borgnine, William Shatner. It, people start just melting at the end, dude. Everyone just starts to melt. Oh, wow. Okay. PG, my friend. PG. Um, well, of course, as you said earlier, Indiana Jones had a lot of melting PG people for a while, too. I mean, whoa. So, oh, yeah. Actually, you know what? Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders, and yeah. I didn't even think about that, but you have Alfred Molina because he's in the beginning of it uh, before, he, you know, before he was famous type thing. Um, and you get to see Spears. And the Nazis him. melt. Yeah. The Nazis melt. And, and, it's, and it's like you're watching someone straight up melt, and it is on camera the entire time as a person's face melts down into nothingness. Yeah, layer by layer. Like, those milky eyeballs always creeped me the hell out. Like, yeah. while, while the rest of his skin and, and sinew and muscle is like washing over his face. And uh, and his glasses are falling off. Like it's like, oh my god! Like you don't mind because it's a Nazi. You're like, okay, cool. No, yeah, but it's exactly. creepy as hell to watch. Yes, the the watching someone melt down, and then you have the poltergeist pulling someone's face off. And mm-hmm. this is stuff that are, that's in PG films. So like your gamut of what is considered PG is very wide. Uh, and I guess G meant you could do G was. I mean, there's G movies that are even out there that I'm like, really? G, that's what you went with. I think Babe Pig in, Babe Pig in the City is G. Okay, yeah. But Babe Pig in the City at certain points is like a kid's horror film. Right, like the slaughterhouse stuff. Yeah, or all yeah. that stuff becomes like a kid's horror film. Yet the movie is rated G. And then you're starting to think like... I mean, shit, Secret of Nim. Yeah. Like those those owls were terrifying. They scared the hell out of a whole generation, you know, mm-hmm. with those glowing eyes of Mrs. Brisby. And you're like, oh, my God. And uh, and that was G. Um, and then, yeah. of course, sometimes the, the video store would put the wrong tape in. You think you're watching a G movie like one time for for uh, Fourth of July. We had uh, um, everybody in the neighborhood over, you know, and uh, all the kids were, were in the living room and my mom had rented the great mouse detective and um it was actually single white female in the uh, in the box and so we all thought it was kind of like a long preview for some crazy movie but then she killed the puppy and we were all screaming (laughs) so so sometimes you try and watch a g movie and it just doesn't work out so babe pig in the city i guess at one point was pg but re-rated to be g in the u.s and uh Directed by George Miller. Oh, really? The Mad oh. Max guy? Did yep. Babe? I didn't yep. realize that. Mm-hmm. Did he do the first one, too? I think so. I think, and he did, like, Happy Feet and stuff like that. He, huh. What, a, what an eclectic career. Dude, he's like, it's like Robert Rodriguez, you know? He goes from Desperado the and... Shark Boy and Lava Girl, yeah. Yeah, and then goes back to doing, like, Planet Terror. And I'm like, wait a second, dude. What? But, right. you know, he, he figures over-the-top violent stuff and then kids' films. It, it ends up making a happy medium, I suppose. Uh-huh. I like most Robert Rodriguez stuff, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm hitter. I like his earlier stuff better, you know, before he he got too CG heavy with things. Yeah. I like the idea of in Desperado, it was like loading the prop shotguns with like blood packs. Mm -hmm. So basically it was just shooting out blood onto the people. I'm like, that's, that's brilliant. I mean, you have some squibs and stuff, but like, that's why you, you know, you see just blood just pour out of people and it's just like, oh, right. And and he gave the world Antonio Banderas. That's true. That's true. Oh man. Uh, Let's see what else was, let's see what else was PG. If this thing that I think is, oh dude, Watership Down. I actually never watched it because, like, all my friends were like, bro, no, don't do that. Dude, Watership Down is PG. That's and, crazy. And it is, I'm looking at just a couple of images here. Uh, the second image on IMDb are... Is a terrified rabbit? No, two rabbits clawing each other and both covered in blood, like fighting oh, each other. It is, and then, oh, 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 no. I'm clicking. This is this should not be PG. This is horrifying. This is absolutely 
no. Oh, none of this is okay. Anyway, I'm going to click <laughs> off of that. I, whatever, all the photos they put on there are just, you know, all these rabbits very traumatized or being attacked by things. PG, guys. And don't they get, like, run over by a thresher at one point or something? I Let's don't know. not get into that. Okay, I, don't, so I, I mean, I'm... I'm not 100% sure. I've pretty much tried to avoid Watership Down, and now I'm like, oof. I know a lot. I've heard people talk about it when they're... I've asked someone once what was their movie that they can't watch, like scary movie, and they straight up were like Watership Down, and I laughed, and they were like, no, I don't think you understand. Yep. I don't think I understood fully. That's I, wild, oof. man. Like, now, I don't really want to watch it, but the curious part of me does. <laughs> Dude, they just remade it, apparently, too, for Netflix or something like that. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. I knew they did, like, New Dark Crystal and stuff like that, but I didn't know about Watership Down. Yeah, I Let's think see. so. Of course, they're remaking everything now, you know. Uh, well, I mean, you know, what else are they going to do? Yeah, that's fair. Uh, the new one is also TVPG, and it is uh, James McAvoy, Nicholas Houts. And John Boyega voicing um, some CGI rabbits. Okay. Well, I like uh, McAvoy and Boyega. Yeah. Um, um, it doesn't seem like it's nearly... It might be as violent. I, I don't think it's as traumatizing looking as the animation for the uh, original one. Right. I mean, that was... You know, I mentioned Secret and M earlier. That was a big reason why it was so creepy was that kind of gritty... Uh, exaggerated realism, uh, you know, in the artwork. Um, yeah. You know, there's big, there's owls again, man, the, the glowing eyes and the big eyebrows and like, yeah, it's really, it's just an owl, but it's like, whoa, that's the creepiest damn owl I've ever seen in my life. And, uh, you know, it was it, wild, man. I mean, even a lot of the old Disney movies, of course, you know, they murder the mom in the beginning of every single one of them, but like 101 Dalmatians is a movie about, getting you to know cute little puppies and then a woman that wants to skin them, you know? And, like, yeah. uh, Oliver and Company, and I know that's a remake of, of Oliver, or a, ta a take on it, rather, but it's, you know, orphans and uh, destitute people, and you know, and just poverty, and, and, like, there's a lot of crazy themes and, and awfulness in there. Well, dude, even stuff like, I'm li like Animal Farm, which came out in 54. Oh, yeah. I mean, right there, we're we're talking about. We know it's going to be not a happy story. Um, even moments in Pinocchio, man, like when he's. Oh yeah, when they turn into the donkeys, that always they creeped me yep. out, man. Yeah. So there's there's all these horror scenes that are thrown into stuff that I feel like if you were to try and put them in modern things of the same ilk, it would not be rated the same they would end up being judged more harshly in a th more in a theatrical realm probably than anything else because and that's what that's kind of where i'm looking at it um off of the mpaa because if you put something on netflix it doesn't matter you can just say it's unrated or you can say tvma whatever it doesn't it's it's a different ratings board than the traditional you know motion picture association of america ratings Right. Yeah, I guess streaming plays by its own rules. Streaming and television kind of do. TV, you know, they'll... I think it's a different ratings board for them. It might be... Because it's, it's like a television thing that came out in the early 90s. Remember, all of a sudden, they started putting, like, TVMA or... Or NYPD Blue was the first, I think, to get a TVMA. Yeah, because of Dennis Franz's butt yep. or whatever. Well, yeah, they were, so. it was nudity. They basically were trying to push the limits of television at the time of... Not cable television, but like basic TV, right. uh, network television, um, by by showing nudity, and that's where they were had their ratings come into play. And then you know that all moved into things like video games as well, which you know it seems like everyone's kind of confused. I mean, when we look back at the M MPAA, it was put together by the board consisted of just regular people. You know, like it was just basic group of that represented America so they would just be like well here we have some parents over here we have some single people over here we have you know whatever and it was basically just luck of the draw on who you had right it was almost like jury duty yeah yeah so you can see every few years they would switch the people and you could see every few years starting from 
I guess really when even before PG-13, but like in the early 80s, especially, you could see every two years or every three years, like the ratings shift a little bit about what was acceptable now and what wasn't. And sometimes right. it would flip flop back and forth until it got to the point where they would list why they were rating a movie. And I remember, I think Mortal Kombat was PG-13 for nonstop action violence or something. I loved all the when they got very specific. Because yeah. I remember when we, uh, my dad took us to see John Carpenter's Vampires in the theater. And when we were looking up the movie times, it uh, one of the thing was VV for vampire violence like it specifically had wow a, a thing for vampire violence i thought that was so funny um but they also had one for like goo not gore like if there was excessive amounts of like slime in a movie it would have like a goo warning um yeah i'm looking at it right now it says r for strong vampire violence and gore language and sexuality yep it's uh it's so wild. And I mean, as much nudity as there is in vampires, I mean, there's a whole party full of prostitutes that gets torn to shreds in the very beginning of the movie. You know, the first thing they want, they're concerned about is not that your kid might see some boobs. It's there's vampire violence, you know, and yeah, come on, man, that's ridiculous. Well, you know, it's it's kind of they would get so descriptive on what would be in these films or why they would rate it something that a film would that should have been r at times was getting pg-13 ratings because they would take the violence that they're doing and try and t say oh well it's this we're we're gonna say because it's this type of cartoonishness to the violence that means that it's totally different so that's gonna make it pg-13 or whatever when it's like really because I really thought that the the like dramatic sequences of certain films that maybe make it a little more intense would up the ante, you know, for some right. some stuff. Uh, but some people just don't care, you know. They they just kind of they were just kind of putting whatever rating on on films. So film ratings, in my opinion, are pretty arbitrary. But I do find that PG thirteen is kind of like the death knell of horror nowadays, and it's only done for supposed profitabil profitability. But in the long run, you don't get that from it. Like the fact that uh, the remake or no, the remake of the TV show, which is ugh, Fantasy Island. That oh, movie. God, that was a terrible movie. Yes. Right. But it's PG-13. And then I saw there's an R rated version and I saw the differences in the violence. And it's like, wow, that's way more violent. No, it doesn't oh, make it I'm any better. I'm not watching that movie twice, bro. Doesn't, sorry. It, look, it yeah. doesn't. Well, you do go to YouTube and then go to Carnage Counts, and then they'll just show you the violence. Like the person, the girl who's in charge of that, she just has like the clips of of just the kills, and then it shows all the kills. Okay. So that'll well, save you time of having to watch it again. Um, and the uh, the silly little reveal at the end was terrible. Um, oh yeah, the yeah, tattoo. yeah, yeah. And uh, but, you know, I I, uh, I avoided watching them for a long time because they were PG-13. I think Blumhouse also did them. I could be wrong. But I did enjoy the uh, the Happy Death Day movies. I thought those were pretty fun. Yeah, well, there's you know, that's there's exceptions to the rule, which are movies like Happy Death Day or um, what is sometimes considered the unofficial Evil Dead 4, uh, which is Drag Me to Hell, because Drag Me to Hell is like. There's an R-rated version of it, but it is a it's a PG-13 horror. Um, a little too much CG for me at times. Whatever, that's beside the point. It's still very effective. The Ring proved that you can take a, an R-rated Japanese horror and turn it into an effective PG-13 horror. None of the follow-ups were able to do the same, so I think you kind of just that's that's one of those like you get lucky type movies same with right the that grudge. was definitely lightning in a bottle for them well yeah and the original the, well the grudge not the original because juan was that but when you have the grudge the american one with sarah michelle geller pg-13 followed up with an uneventful sequel and then you end up remaking it with an r-rated one that just came out about a year ago that was just obliterated in the reviews Right. Yeah, I never even tried to watch that one. So, you know, it's 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 tricky. I think that, you know, at the end of the day it comes down to what studios 
want and what they see is profitability and that is not a good thing for horror usually right like it's got a yeah it's uh it's funny like you were talking about earlier a lot of them are apprehensive to do kind of the genre mixing and stuff but that's also one of the only ways it seems like horror appeals to a studio is like okay it's this kind of movie but it's got horror overtones or whatever and they're oh, okay you know um if you'd go in with straight horror it's you know they'll either try and dumb it down to pg-13 like you said in the under the guise of profitability um and possibly take the soul out of the movie if there was one to begin with depending on the movie of course um or they they just they don't get behind it don't market it um you know i mean even though it was kind of a genre mashup of like horror and war like overlord you know uh which i i really liked i thought that was really well done um but there was like barely any marketing for it no real yeah. push for it it was it all had to be word of mouth you know um well there was also the 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 bad false push of people thought it was a cloverfield film oh okay i didn't know that yeah. so initially it was meant to be people thought it was an untitled cloverfield thing cuz jj abrams was like producing it mm -hmm. and they thought okay it takes place in this alternate you know reality or we see how it all began and they were like no that's not it pretty much after god particle was turned into cloverfield paradox and it turned out to be just not good at all that was a terrible movie yeah that basically put like an end to that and then overlord came out but i don't think they knew how to really market it because if you just said hey guys do you remember uh return to castle wolfenstein from the early 2000s this is that I mean, a that's, a, that's a very accurate description, yeah. But, I mean, they've had some very successful Wolfenstein games in the past few years, like after they rebooted the series and right, stuff. Right, but I'm saying if they had pitched it as that almost in their marketing instead of how they did, which they didn't do it as a Wolfenstein approach, they, they basically showed the big reveal of the guy's face in the trailer, which made it seem like PG-13 CG horror. Because you see his face and you're like, well, this doesn't look. They can't. This can't be real because they're showing this and this can't be practical effects. But it's all practical effects. They showed this dude's completely mangled face that is actually layered practical effects in a trailer on television, uh, and they tried to, I guess, tone down some of the blood on his face or whatever. But I'm like, you ruined your marketing because you didn't know how to market it properly you put mm. that out you put this awesome cool reveal to show practical stuff and made it seem like it was all crappy cg yeah oh, of course and then you know uh, from dust till dawn back in the day they marketed it basically as a a tarantino-esque you know heist movie and stuff and yeah. then a third of the way to halfway through it turns into a crazy over the top vampire movie and i loved that you know that was uh, a great pulling, way of doing it pulling like, the rug out from under you there like yeah yeah but then you know you, you end up with movies that they don't know how to market which are like grindhouse if we want to talk about the same thing do I remember people leaving the theater halfway through after they saw Planet Terror? <laughs> Thinking it was just one movie, yeah. They they did it. They didn't realize that like the the credits would end off one, would have more of these fake trailers, and it would go on because people didn't pay attention. And it, I think Dimension or, or whoever it was at the time didn't know how to to market it properly out to people. Um, they said oh, yeah, this, I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah. They said this is what it is, but they didn't try and explain like it's an old school double feature, guys. This is the way it's done. Like there, there's issues where these awesome novelties or these cool things that could work, or even the type of film that it is. It's like let's say you have a movie and certain producers end up picking it up because they love where you're going with it. They think this is perfect. I love this concept. Let's make this movie. You get the budget to make the movie. All of a sudden, with three months into it, that person is fired. Then someone else comes in, or it's a merger and someone takes over, and now there's a new executive in charge of everything, and they see what has been done, and they don't get it. They don't understand it. Right, they it. don't like it, yeah. So it ends up getting shelved, and, or it ends up getting completely changed around, like Knights of Bad Astem, where this person's like, well, I have, the, I own the rights to it, and I don't like the fact that there's gore in it, so we're just going to take out all the gore and all the horror elements and turn it into just a really shitty comedy oh, that yeah. the director I remember Peter disowns. Dinklage telling people, don't go see that movie. Yeah, <laughs> like, 
and this is where I, I rant on the issue of studios and why I have problems with studio films, and I think indie is the way to go. Or, you know, if you're if you're not going to go indie and you are going to work with studios, work with small studios that are focused on telling a story. Because the reason all these PG horror films work so well is because at the end of the day, there's a story anchoring every single one of them. Characters that feel real. Characters who have dialogue that sounds like you just understand you empathize with these characters you can see yourself in them as well right exactly you're you're on the ride with them you're not yeah. watching i mean obviously you're watching a movie but you're you're almost a participant mm -hmm. in it with them you know well, and, um, and pg keeps a safety most of the time not all the time not in the original like vault of horror tales from the crypt but you know in in certain PG horror, Gremlins, uh, Poltergeist, there is safety at the end of the day because you know that things are going to work out for the protagonists. But it doesn't work out for everyone right. involved usually in the film. So there's that tension. You're on a thrill ride. You're on like a roller coaster. A roller co it, it's just really good storytelling. It's like a good video game that's got good storytelling in that with replayability. You know, you could go in there with a hack and slash, fine, but that gets boring after a while. You know, you'll, you'll do it every once in a while, but you don't want to go back to that all the time. It's something that's good storytelling that's layered, that has more to it, that gives you a world that embraces that world. I think that's, that's uh, essential. Oh, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's prosthetics and storytelling are the things that have kind of been lost over the years. You know what I mean? Not yeah. totally, but that's, I think what has led to this deluge of kind of lackluster horror. Mm -hmm. And I mean, God, look at the, the prequel to the thing, you know, that they did with, with Winstead and everybody. Um, that's and so, they, they that's had so done exciting. practical effects and then, the, uh, the studio or producer came in and said, oh, I don't like this. So they literally made them draw CG, bad CG, over the practical effects they'd already done. Yeah, because, yeah, it was like a new producer came in and said, this looks too much like 1980s style effects. This looks they're too like, much well, like an duh. 80s movie. <laughs> like, and that's like, what we wanted, yeah. Yeah, it's a fucking prequel to The Thing. Of course it's supposed... But that you're exactly right. It, that that's that is a prime example of studio interference, and them not knowing what what to do with with something that is gold that is right in their hands. Mm -hmm. um, and even films that are that were PG horror that aren't well known, like uh, another Toby Hooper film from '86 called Invaders from Mars, which is a remake of uh, I think a 1950s film, Invaders from Mars. Uh, this has Karen Black in it and Hunter Carson and Timothy Bottoms is in it, too It is a very weird movie with some amazing practical effects But the only reason that I actually remember it so well It's because the practical effects and the visual stuff in it and like you have you have somewhat of a story like Toby Hooper always gives some extra oomph to his films uh, which this normally would have probably just been thrown by the wayside but it's also a screenplay by dan o'bannon so i automatically have a little more faith in it mm. if you don't know who dan o'bannon is he he wrote a little movie alien. called alien <laughs> um he wrote a screenplay for another movie that you may know called return of the living dead uh life force you didn't know, he have he, something to do with um total recall right but no i'm thinking of the one <sighs> God, I really I like the movie a lot, and it's uh, it follows the sheriff, and like uh, it starts with the guy on the beach taking pictures of the girl, and they kill him, they wrap him up in the net and burn him, and then he's a member of the town after that. Like it's all the resurrected people. You oh, Dead and Buried. There you go. Yes, didn't he have yeah. something to do with that? He wrote Dead and Buried. Yeah, I like that movie. Not enough to remember the title apparently, but <laughs> I really enjoyed that movie a lot. Yeah, and actually um, he directed Return of the Living Dead as well. That's a Dan O'Bannon film. Okay. It was his uh, first feature credit, and the only other one he did was 1991's The Resurrected. Okay. I don't know that I've watched that one. I have not seen that one either, no, but it's uh, based on The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, which is an H.P. Lovecraft story. So, hey. Oh, okay. Might be Learn something watching. new every day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Chris Sarandon's in it. Uh, automatically, I'm, I'm company, interested. Company, company, company. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, man, I, you know, there's there's something about, you know, even movies like It's Alive, PG, 
Really? With the creepy ass baby? Wow. Yeah, okay. with the creepy ass baby. The first one is rated PG. It's such a strange thing. Um, but you could get away with so much. It was it was a different time. Mm-hmm. Yep. A lot of lot less people uh looking for things to be offended by, I suppose. I guess, yeah. Well, also, you know, the internet's not out there, so people can scream it at the top of their lungs, but if they're not near them, they're not going to hear it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I didn't even really think about that. <laughs> well, my small town papers reviewer didn't like it. So. Yeah, exactly. And they're like, oh, who's that person, you know? And they don't care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the internet gives a, gives a whole sense of anonymity and everything to these people mm-hmm. to, to just spew hate and then walk away from the, the damage they've done, like uh, like David Caruso in the beginning of any episode of CSI Miami. Yep, <laughs> just pulls his, pulls his sunglasses off. and Yeah! Yeah, so, <laughs> explosion. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, man, uh, it's... Uh, definitely giving me a couple uh, that I haven't seen that I'm going to go look up and watch. And um, I totally agree with, you know, with you saying that it's uh, it PG meant a lot like uh, something world's different back then than it does now. You know? Yeah. It, uh, PG actually had some weight to it uh, for a lot of films because, you know, G was uh, most films were for a general audience and they treated it like that. G was not just for kids films. Right. But then parental guidance, where it was oh, okay, and then R, you're getting into this is just it's not movies, not meant for kids, you know. Uh, it's like your Godfathers, your French connections, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, and um, Godfather, of course, widely regarded as one of the best movies. If well, Godfather two, I guess, but yeah, which is so strange. But you know, they they go so well together. It's almost like one film, and then three is this thing. Right, yeah. I've never watched three, but I've heard uh, it's, never heard anything good about it. I liked Goodfellas. <laughs> Goodfellas is, is great, but uh, Godfather 3 is just, it's there. It, it just felt like a letdown. I mean, for some of the story to get a little more out of it, you're like, okay, but the performances are not are not quality, in my opinion. Right. Uh, but yeah, look, PG PG horror meant something. There was a time where it it was effective. It still is effective to rewatch those films, just because the rating on a film, you know, before 1990 is PG, and it's a horror film, or PG 13, and it's a horror film. Do not cast it aside, especially PG 13 in the 80s. If it's PG 13 horror in the 80s. Just watch it, because there's going to be some weird shit that you're going to see. Yep, there'll at least be one memorable thing. Or yeah, in the case might... of Life Force, two very memorable things. Okay, Life Force is <laughs> R, dude. Like, we're, you, okay, you're... I wish it were PG-13. Life I just Force... like Life Force, Rob. I'm sorry. Life Force okay. has so much nudity in it. It is just like, there's no way in hell that would ever be rated PG-13. <laughs> eh, that's fair. It's um, good nudity, though. But like the bride is that type where it's it's like oh, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, like PG thirteen back in the yeah, well, let's see what else. Uh, Monster Squad was PG thirteen. Uh, the Gate is PG thirteen. There's more. They exist. You can find them. <laughs> Look them up and watch them. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, or just ask me. Find me on the message board thing. There's no message board. But on the comments for wherever the podcast is and be like, hey, what do you think of this? I might answer back in a reasonable amount of time. Maybe. Maybe. I do. I'm bad. I'm terrible with like digital communications or communications in general. <laughs> well, you know, you're, you're a busy guy right now. So yeah, busy, busy. Well, anyway, uh, Hey Mike, yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on and uh, doing this today. Well, thank you for having me on, man, and uh, yeah. always enjoy listening to Oh the Horror. So <laughs> uh, it's always fun to be a part of it. Um, well, thanks for being on. Um, I'm Rob Holmes, and uh, that'll do it for us this week on Oh the Horror. I'd like to thank my guest Mike Haston, and until next time, stay scared. Time to keep your appointment with the Wicker Man. And there's no more room in hell.